I'm Bruce Mast. Uh, I'm from Gainesville, Florida. This is Jennifer Walden from, you're in Texas, right? Austin. Austin, right. And um, uh, this is going to be a session two aesthetics. Uh, the first paper is, uh, is titled, Is There a Limit Risk Assessment Model of Liposuction Lipoaspirate Volume and Morbidity Following Abdominal Plasty? And Dr. Dorfman? Uh, Mr. Dorfman. Soon to be Dr. Dorfman. Okay. Hopefully. Uh, Mr. Dorfman will now present the uh, paper. Good morning. My name is Robert Dorfman, and I'd like to start off by thanking the association for this incredible opportunity to present here. We have no relevant disclosures. According to the most recent ASPS statistics, over 120,000 abdominoplasty procedures were performed in 2016. Combined abdominoplasty and liposuction of the abdomen and flank has been performed in a variety of iterations for over three decades and has become an increasingly common procedure. Lack of central and lateral liposuction may yield a suboptimal aesthetic result, as the fat deposits not removed with the abdominoplasty tissue resection remain. Trunk liposuction combined with abdominoplasty gives an improved trunk contour from a 360 degree perspective, treating the trunk as a single aesthetic unit. However, despite growing popularity and potential benefits, the safety of the one-stage procedure has been the subject of debate, largely fueled by incongruent or inadequate scientific and safety data. Early studies warned against combining liposuction of the anterior abdomen with abdominoplasty due to concerns for increased risk of thrombotic or fat embolic complications, vascular disruption, and even necrosis. These concerns have carried over to the present day with both scientific and media articles continuing to report concern for patient safety. So where does this leave us? Well, the lack of consensus from the plastic surgeon community regarding the safety of the procedure and several highly publicized media reports on isolated incidences of patient complications and deaths has resulted in regulatory actions over the volume of lipoaspirate in this procedure. States across the country responded by imposing legislative restrictions on combining procedures and limiting lipoaspirate volumes to anywhere from nothing to 2,000 milliliters with little guiding evidence. Consequently, our current study aimed to inform the ongoing discussion of the safety of adjuvant liposuction in abdominoplasty. Our hypotheses were twofold. Number one, Truncal liposuction combined with abdominoplasty is a safe procedure in the hands of board-certified plastic surgeons. And number two, current lipoaspirate guidelines do not accurately reflect surgical risk. The TOPS database was analyzed for procedures with CPT codes assigned to abdominoplasty alone or in combination with truncal liposuction. Lipoaspirate volume reflected the extent of liposuction and patients undergoing mini or modified abdominoplasty were excluded to exclude techniques where the superior abdominal flap is not elevated. The procedure description variable was further assessed to exclude patients who underwent additional concomitant procedures. And multivariate regression models were developed to control for the influence of potential confounding variables and determine the independent effect of liposuction on complications in abdominoplasty, as well as to determine the effect of increasing lipoaspirate volumes on complications. A total of 11,191 patients met inclusion criteria, with approximately 86% of these patients undergoing liposuction in combination with abdominoplasty, and 14% of these patients undergoing traditional abdominoplasty. In general, patients undergoing abdominoplasty with liposuction had more comorbidities. For example, there were higher rates of smokers and diabetics in patients undergoing the combined procedure. After adjusting for patient comorbidities and operative characteristics, the addition of liposuction was independently associated with the reduced risk of both overall complications and seroma. The addition of adjuvant liposuction in abdominoplasty did not, increase, did not independently increase the risk of overall surgical complications, overall medical complications, VTE, or readmission. Now, this may be explained by inherent procedural differences. Traditional abdominoplasty alone necessitates dissection of large areas of the flap where perforating vessels supplying 80% of blood to the abdominal wall are located. The, additional, the addition of abdominal liposuction may require less undermining of the flap and may better preserve neurovascular supply, 
thus mitigating factors that are known drivers of post-operative complications. Moreover, the presence of large, poorly adhering surfaces creates a potential space, which in the setting of tissue trauma and disrupted lymphatics drives seroma formation. In these conditions, it is no surprise that seroma is one of the most common post-operative complications in abdominoplasty. Importantly, analysis of the 1,611 patients with recorded aspirate volume demonstrated that absolute lipoaspirate volume did not have any appreciable effect on the risk of complications. Currently regulated thresholds of 500 milliliters and 1,000 milliliters were also independently evaluated, again, with no significant effect on the rate of morbidity. Now, all this being said, our study certainly has limitations. Of those pertaining to the TOPS database, the inability to delineate the exact technique of abdominoplasty, the type of liposuction, or specific location of trunk liposuction are of particular significance. This limitation prohibits an accurate estimation of absolute risk in patients undergoing a variety of surgical techniques, but it does not necessarily detract from our comparative analysis and purpose. You know, there's the old saying, ask five different plastic surgeons how they perform a procedure, and you're gonna get 10 different answers. So indeed, the technical ambiguity supports our purpose and that we are able to draw conclusions on a specialty-wide scale, irrespective of single surgeon preferences. Furthermore, TOPS captures complications for only 30 days postoperatively and likely underestimates the true total complication rates. But this bias is unlikely to differentially impact the two procedures and is unlikely to affect our comparative analysis. Similarly, there's concern for the self-reported nature of the program's data and the lack of granularity with cosmetic outcomes or patient satisfaction. But when compared to other validated registries, such as NISQIP and Cosmetisure, the TOPS database has been shown to accurately capture outcomes, including those uh, specifically germane to the plastic surgical community across both private practice and academic settings. Ultimately, our results support that irrespective of preferred technical iteration, in the hands of board-certified plastic surgeons, the use of liposuction in abdominoplasty is indeed a safe adjuvant to traditional abdominoplasty. Furthermore, given the paucity of scientific data available to inform volumetric thresholds for unsafe liposuction, the question is raised. Are current legislative limits on liposuction justified in abdominoplasty? Our results indicate that the answer is no. Neither the proposed 500 milliliters nor 1,000 milliliter thresholds were independently associated with an increased likelihood of postoperative morbidity. This suggests that current lipoaspirate guidelines do not accurately reflect surgical risk in the hands of board-certified plastic surgeons. Once again, thank you so much for this incredible opportunity to present our research here. We look forward to taking any questions you may have. Thank you. Our discussion is Dr. Eric Swanson. Well, first of all, what an impressive presentation. I learned just yesterday that Rob Dorfman is actually a medical student, and I'm looking for big things to come in the future. I mean, I'm just really impressed. And I'm impressed with this study. I, I, I was worried that maybe the authors would try to find a link between combined procedures and risk, as a lot of studies have done, and yours was refreshing that it did not do that. And I think the answer is pretty clear today after 20 years of uh, studies that you can combine liposuction and abdominoplasty safely, and you should do that because it improves the aesthetic outcome of the result. Now, what is the important factor? I think the important thing is blood loss, and this is something that I've investigated. I uh, actually did CBCs on my patients, 150 consecutive liposuction patients, and I found to my surprise that patients having over 5,000 cc's of super wet aspirate had estimated blood losses that averaged over 1,000 cc's. And this was clearly third space blood loss. And doing an abdominoplasty at the same time added 290 cc's. This was startling to me. I reported it in PRS in 2012. And that certainly affected my practice because we really need to limit our blood loss. The Cosmetisure data, there are too many patients arriving in ERs and being admitted to hospitals and getting blood transfusions. You know, that's really not tolerable in cosmetic, elective cosmetic patients. So we shouldn't just go with wild abandon and think there is no limit. It's, you know, it's rare that I will aspirate more than two or three liters at the same time that I do an abdominoplasty. Uh, now some questions. I think you covered the first one 
uh, the reliability of the data. Of course, whenever you're using a data set like this, you mentioned that it's self-reported, but they're not, you know, they're not consecutive patients, and I wor worry that you're missing uh, complications for that reason. The other question I had, the data did not indicate whether these were tumescent cases or these were super wet cases. So what do you do with those aspirate you know, volumes? And explaining the advantage, you know, why should the combined procedure actually have more favorable results in terms of complications than seroma? You mentioned undermining, you speculated that maybe there was more undermining in the abdominal plasty, but I don't think that that was clearly established by your study. My own studies suggest that perfusion is really not the issue, and I wonder whether maybe those are paniculectomies, maybe they were like not cosmetic cases, maybe greater weight loss, maybe higher resection, you know, weights in those patients. I wondered if there was something distinct about those patients, and I wanted to ask you about that. And finally, do you think there's a limit? Um, these are all excellent, excellent questions. Um, you know, you, you bring up really important points. These are major limitations, and we acknowledge those. Um, so, you know, perhaps the most poignant question of this talk is, well, why use big data at all then? Because these are limitations. And perhaps the most poignant answer to that question is that if we're not going to use this, the government will, and insurance companies certainly will. And perhaps the perfect example of this is the ProPublica Surgeon Scorecard where ProPublica, which is a group that took administrative data, and they rank surgeons based on this administrative data without any surgeon input. So anyone who's doing any kind of complicated or risky procedures was penalized. So that's, you know, there are, you know, much of what we know about risk does come from very good, uh, excellent intra-institutional studies and single surgeon studies, but there are limitations to those studies as well. So there are different patient populations, different surgeon experience, and perhaps, one of the solutions to this barrier in generalizability lies in multi-institutional, large-scale big data. Um, do we think there is a limit? We, we, I, you know, I cannot speculate, and all I can show is that our study did not find any difference in what we examined. And what we recommend is that plastic sur surgeons use their clinical judgment. So there were only, I think, five thousand. Uh, I think like 47 cases that went over 5,000 cc's. So that was not very common. Um, it was like 3% total. So most plastic surgeons are using their clinical judgment. And I think what this speaks to is the arbitrariness of these guidelines. Because if you go to Ohio, you can't do any liposuction in combination with this procedure. If you go to Florida, you can do 1,000 milliliters. If you go to Tennessee, you can do 2,000 milliliters. You go to New Jersey, there's no limits. So it's completely arbitrary, and it's largely because of isolated incidences um, you know, that are being reported in the popular media. And much of the risk, much of those cases, occurred in large volume liposuction. Now, those volumes don't necessarily pertain to the combined procedure. Um, just because they're, you know, they're different procedures. So that's one thing that we found. And again, I can only report based on what our data shows. And in terms of mechanisms, you know, you're right. Our study does not answer the question of you know, how this is possibly occurring. Why is there this protective effect? Um, that might have just been statistically significant, but statistical significance doesn't always mean clinical significance. So that might just be something that we just found incidentally. But it's not any more dangerous, and that's what we were trying to show. Thank you. Hi, Andrew Chen from Connecticut. No disclosures. Um, thank you for your presentation and for acknowledging the limitations with some of the data sets. I just had a question. There was something that you mentioned. We're looking at these two populations of patients, and they're not the same in terms of their risk factors. And you mentioned risk adjusting. Could you elaborate a little bit on how you did that and how Absolutely. that may have impacted some of the outcomes? So I'll go. Oh, I guess I can't. I guess I can't go back on the slides. But what we first did was there was a difference, and I, it's tough to explain why that difference might have occurred. Perhaps plastic surgeons were thinking that in diabetics and in smokers, using lipoabdominoplasty or the combined technique would be safer because there is less undermining, so perhaps that might explain it, but that's just something that we found. Um, and you know, it's, in terms of how we did the actual modeling, what we use is multivariate logistic regression analyses. So what that does is that isolates the independent effects. So what I first presented was the raw unadjusted outcomes, and we show that there was a difference. But you know, there could be confounders, right? So BMI, smoking status, that could all confound. So what we used was SPSS, and we did these multivariate regression analyses where we isolated the independent effect of each variable. And that's where we found that 
there was a difference with seroma and overall complications. And we further validated this with some other advanced statistics like C statistics and Homer Lemeshaw statistics that also indicated adequate uh, goodness of fit. All right, we're just about out of time. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. In the meantime, uh, we have an interesting uh, tweeting uh, that um, a comment about um, is there any data about um, how many of these procedures done by non plastic surgeons? So there's something that we can think about it later, unless you have any data about it. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay, our next speaker is um, Rand Stark, and we're gonna talk about the anatomic implications of utilizing cannula lipodissection and avoiding platysmoplasty in the tumescent facelift, a clinical and cadaveric study um, with Catherine Chang, Martin Carney, Jason Weisler, Lou Bucky, out of the University of Pil Pennsylvania, Philadelphia, and the discussant will be Jeff Janis. Thank you. Um, I'm Mike Mirzabegi from uh, the University of Pennsylvania. Um, uh, there's obviously wide variation in technique and approach to ridectomy. And furthermore, objective uh, anatomic assessment is rare, and clinical results can be difficult uh, to, to quantitate. So ultimately, as a result, there's controversy regarding distinguishing features uh, which separate one technique uh, from another. Uh, three of those distinguishing features are the soft tissue dissection, the management of the SMAS, and the approach to the neck. Uh, this iteration of the tumescent facelift uh, was developed by the senior author over a series of 1,000 consecutive uh, facelifts. And there are really two key principles that are stressed by uh, the technique. The first is cannula lipodissection rather than wide undermining, and the second is avoiding anterior platysmoplasty, uh, following elevation of the SMAS flap. Uh, this concept of cannula lipodissection was borrowed from uh, Saldano's concept of lipoabdominoplasty, uh, which avoids wide undermining and utilizes a cannula for lipodissection and as a result, uh, leads to an efficient process which minimizes the disruption of neurovascular perforators, all the while maintaining uh, adequate skin excursion. So the first question that we had for our study was, in rhinodectomy, can one achieve equivalent skin excursion with cannula dissection uh, as opposed to wide undermining? And the other concept that I had mentioned was avoiding platysmoplasty. So this mass is contiguous with the platysma, uh, so superior, superior SMAS excursion and anterior platysma application may act as opposing forces. So in our mind, avoiding platysmoplasty is avoiding this tug of war and, and not opposing SMAS movement. And so the second question we had for our study was, does platysmoplication inhibit uh, SMAS excursion and or jowl excursion? And again, the, that was the, the purpose of our study, examining skin excursion with lipodissection and examining the effects of anterior platysmoplasty. So this is an anatomical evaluation uh, based on 1,000 consecutive facelifts. Our anatomic work was done on five uh, fresh tissue cadavers. So we marked out uh, the cadaver just as we would a routine facelift. Uh, the medial limit of the sharp soft tissue dissection uh, was from the tragus uh, to the uh, body of the zygoma. It's about five centimeters. And then we drop a line down to the angle of the mandible. And again, that's the limit of our sharp uh, dissection. And our vector pull for the skin is perpendicular to the nasolabial fold. We then mark out uh, our SMAS dissection, uh, which is from the arch uh, down to uh, the junction of the platysma. And our vector of pull is superior medial. Uh, again, on the cadavers, we started with our sharp dissection, just as we uh, otherwise normally would. And again, that, that's the limit of uh, what we do sharply. Uh, and then we use a cannula, it's an eight millimeter cannula, uh, to lipodissect the remainder of the soft tissue. So again, this is largely done sharply, and then the remainder and some additional medial dissection is done uh, with the cannula. And what you're left with are a series of tunnels, which are separated by the neurovascular perforators uh, that are preserved. So then we measured uh, post-auricular skin excursion after the lipodissection. And for all of the measurements in the study, we used a digital force gauge uh, to ensure that we were using equivalent force and pull uh, with every measurement. Uh, they, we then went back and then released all of these attachments. Um, and then we re-measured this post-auricular skin excursion, again, using the same amount of force. This is just a sequence. So again, we cannula lipodissected, measured the skin. We went back and released everything and, and then re-measured. Uh, we then elevated the SMAS flap. Again, this is from the arch down to the junction of the platysma and pulled in a superior medial vector. And we measured SMAS excursion at the tip of the SMAS flap. And then we also measured jowl excursion in reference to the uh, mandibular border. 
We then uh, opened up the neck of the cadaver through a submental incision, uh, plicated the anterior neck, and then we just repeated these two measurements. So again, this is just a summary. So we measured excursion at the tip of the smash slap, we measured jowl excursion, we then opened up the neck, plicated, and then remeasured uh, both of these points. Moving on to the results, so skin excursion with tunneling alone was about four centimeters. And importantly, skin excursion after releasing everything was essentially about the same. It was about four centimeters, and uh, there was no uh, difference in, in gain length. Uh, SMAS excursion at the tip without neck plication was a little under four centimeters. Notice that the force that we're pulling on the SMAS is, a, is typically about two to three times that of what we pull on the skin. And after plicating the neck, the uh, excursion of the tip of the SMAS slap was not dramatically inhibited. I was slightly inhibited, but it was not statistically significant. But this is probably our most important slide. So jowl excursion without neck plication was a little under two centimeters, uh, but the jowl did not move very well uh, after neck plication. And the difference uh, in reference to the manipular border was statistically significant. So uh, we found equivalent skin excursion with lipodissection. And I think there are distinct advantages to doing lipodissection. Again, you preserve the perforators, it's efficient. You preserve some of the attachments of the SMAS to the skin, particularly in the, the lower medial third, and you decrease some of the flattening you can get uh, in over-dissected areas. And again, we, um, we found that midline plication inhibits excursion of the jowl and the medial uh, soft tissue of the lower third of the face, but it did not inhibit uh, the upward rotation of the distal aspect of the flap. And I think the reason for that is the exhibiting force, which is the platysmal plication, uh, is closer to the target area, which is the jowl, and that's why it had a more significant impact in that, in that lower medial third. And then so after we uh, made all our measurements, we just degloved the skin of the neck to just get a better sense of what we were seeing, and we used towel clips to sort of uh, mock the uh, plication that we had done. And you can see that uh, that plication pulls that soft tissue down uh, below the border of the mandible, and when you pull on this mass, uh, it just simply does not move up as well. Uh, compared to the side that is not plicated. This is just another view, and you can see more towel clips applied. The tissue, particularly on the, the left side of the cadaver, is pulled beneath the border of the mandible, uh, and when you move this mass, it just does not move uh, very well. So one recent paper that really resonated uh, with us was from Italy, and they found that with midline plication, they had a high rate of uh, band recurrence at one year, and so they've moved to favoring a, a lateral approach to the neck. And so I think for us, this isn't a, a call to end all midline plication. Obviously, it's, it's used by many people to achieve excellent results, um, but there's a wide variation in rhinodectomy technique. So, so we don't overreach our conclusions. I think it's important to say that these findings are specific to this dissection and, and this vector uh, of pull. And so for us, you know, treating platysmal descent in bands, we feel that using that supermedial uh, vector of pull uh, is critical in shaping the neck. And now we've started to add this Mario procedure uh, for significant banding, uh, you know, based on uh, that technique that uh, I just mentioned. Uh, so in conclusion, uh, cannula lipodissection is an effective means to recruit skin and soft tissue in rhinodectomy. Uh, anterior platysmoplasty may inhibit excursion of soft tissue in the lower medial third uh, of the face. Uh, I just wanted to thank Dr. Cerletti and the Division of Penn for generously uh, you know, supporting this project. I want to thank Dr. Levin uh, for allowing us to use his human tissue lab uh, to do the cadaver work. So thank you. Discussion by Dr. Janice. Actually, uh, Dr. Randall Yatman is substituting for Dr. Janice. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Um, excellent talk. <clears throat> They're yeah. um, well presented. Uh, um, these are concepts that have been talked about by the senior author quite a bit in the past and from a clinical perspective, and it's nice to see it kind of duplicated with the cadaver dissection. Um, I just have a couple questions. Since you don't open the neck very often, how do you manage uh, subletismal fat? Uh, and also, can you really explain better why you think that um, your technique doesn't inhibit excursion of the SMAS flap, but it does inhibit excursion of the, uh, the jowl? And also, is there any uh, difference between techniques in platysmoplasty that adversely affect the movement of the gel more than others, i.e. Mm -hmm. more tension 
pan solar vest kind of things, do you think uh, that would inhibit it even more? Thank you. Well, uh, thank you for your comments. Um, I, clinically, I can't give you what percentage of the time he opens the neck to defat that submental area. Uh, it, it's not very common. So I, I don't think that's, that, that's something that clinically he does routinely. And my point with the, the tip of the SMAS moving is that that force that's exhibited uh, is so far away uh, from the distal tip of the SMAS flap. I think in pulling, you're able to just recruit more tissue. Uh, and somehow there's some com compensatory uh, tissue recruitment that you actually get some uh, movement that you don't see uh, close to where that application is. Um, and then as far as other things that can inhibit, uh, you know, jowl movement, uh, you know, he obviously likes to, you know, elevate this mass, release a lot of those, uh, you know, masseteric uh, ligaments and get true recruitment of this mass flap. Uh, so that's sort of his, um, you know, his preference. And I think, uh, I think in some ways that can be seen when you, you know, uh, and, and is somewhat validated by what we saw in the cadaver lab. Dr. Zins? Uh, Jim Zins from uh, Cleveland. Uh, very nice paper. Um, it, from your dissection, uh, your skin dissection, it looked quite limited, uh, and it did not look to me like you uh, adequately released all the zones of adhesion or ligamentous attachments. Um, and if you do not uh, uh, do that, um, how do you, how do you uh, explain the release with a uh, blunt liposuction uh, technique as opposed to scissor dissection. Um, the second question was, at least on the video, it looked to me like you were doing your application of the uh, uh, platysma uh, before the SMAS elevation. So I, I wish you'd clarify that because I think it's extremely important that you do the SMAS first, reposition the SMAS, which then repositions, so allows you to passively reposition the jowl. Uh, and then do the platysmic plasty where you're just taking up the laxity rather than working against it. Uh, and then just to expand on uh, Dr. Yetman's statement, it's not only subplatysmal fat that we address when we make a midline uh, approach to the platysma, but we contour the digastric muscles. Or we can also approach uh, the submaxillary gland uh, and contour that intermediate plane, which is extremely mm -hmm. important, especially in the older age group. So I think your technique, uh, in fact, would be best on a younger age group, but I would be hesitant to, uh, to use this on an older age group with significant, significant platysmal banding and uh, problems in that so-called intermediate uh, plane. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, I think the, and I, I thought the same when I, you know, we took a series of pictures when we did the cadaver dissections, and the, the picture that we have in there for the limit of the sharp dissection, I don't think is fully representative of the limit of what most of these were. It, it was wider than that, both clinically when we do this and then when we were actually in there. So I think at that whatever point that picture was taken, I don't think it does justice to the, the full breadth of which the soft tissue is dissected. Um, and then, as you mentioned, the, I think the sequence is very important. Um, so, you know, if you, you know, placate the neck and then pull up on the SMAS, you know, you may ultimately find uh, different results, you know, if that sequence is reversed. And we didn't, uh, you know, we didn't go back and reverse the sequence and saw that affects things. But uh, there's no question that's probably very uh, important. And then again, you know, clinically, he doesn't typically defat the submental area, but you know, I, I would be curious to see how many times that submental area is defatted and then the submandibular glands are accentuated or the diastrics accentuated after it's defatted. So um, that may be why, uh, you know, for him, you know, he, that he doesn't defat and then subsequently he doesn't address the uh, submandibular glands as regularly. How do you... Um for those of us who do a lot of max facelifts, um, we don't usually open up the central neck, mm -hmm. and the uh, effect is pretty similar to what you're showing here. Do you have any comments about that? And no, I mean, depending on, on uh, what pattern you put in your suture for the max lift, I mean, uh, we regularly do it for secondary cases, uh, so we're very familiar with, uh, with that uh, technique. But uh, you know, presumably, depending on the orientation of your max suture, uh, when you tighten it, you get the same vector of, of lift, uh, and not, and so, which is, again, can be a more superior medial vector. Um, but presumably, if you, if you place your max, max lift stitch and you have the neck plicated or not plicated, I think you would probably find the same uh, you know, anatomic uh, result. Any uh, online questions? No. Nope. All right. Well, we'll move on to the next paper. Thank you very much. Um,
Uh, third paper is entitled Prospective Double Blind Evaluation of Umbilical Reconstruction of Techniques Using Conventional and Crowdsourcing Methods. Uh, Dr. Lin uh, will be presenting, and this is uh, from uh, uh, Beth Israel Deaconess uh, and Harvard Medical School. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Um, as you can see, it took a village to finish this project over the last four years. <laughs> We know that deep flap breast reconstruction has increased in popularity. One key component of this procedure is the umbilical plasty and with respect to that procedure. There are a variety of incisions utilized for umbilical plasty in this procedure. However, no consensus regarding what might be the best technique, the best incision, and best overall technique. Prior evidence has been based on surgeons and or patient evaluation. Our aims were to evaluate aesthetic outcomes of different umbilical plasty techniques in deep flap breast reconstruction and to compare opinions of the general public with plastic surgeons. The three different types of incision types we uh, looked at were the diamond, oval, and inverted V uh, techniques for incisions. What is crowdsourcing? Crowdsourcing represents taking a function once performed by employees and outsourcing it to a generally large network of people in the form of an open call enrollment. And this was originally described by Howe and Robinson in Wired 2006. It sets a task and involves a human intelligence, uh, with, that involves human intelligence to be able to complete this task. It also uh, collects general questions in terms of demographics, age, um, uh, gender, as well as basic financial information provides a monetary reimbursement, and is otherwise a relatively inexpensive research tool that's widely used otherwise in industry. It most often times uh, at this point involves the online platform Amazon Mechan Mechanical Turk, or MTurk. The Turk uh, was a machine in the 18th century, which was uh, originally uh, described and, and finally found out as a fake chess playing machine or sideshow where there was actually a person inside this machine making the moves uh, in an active chess playing match. These days, a mechanical Turk is an expression for a machine able to do an automated task in reality being done by a human being. And so, crowdsourcing has made its way into the literature. It's been used to assess surgical skill and uh, in different techniques uh, across the literature in, in different fields as well as our own uh, field in PRS, uh, looking at outcomes. So in January and April, to April of 2013, we studied patients undergoing uh, deep flap breast reconstruction uh, who were uh, prospectively included. Uh, we phrased this and studied this as a double-blinded um, study. Uh, by definition, in our practice, uh, our co-surgeons closed the abdominal donor site, and so the primary surgeon uh, was uh, unaware of the plasty um, incision type. We used the program to also otherwise randomize the incision type being used that day. Uh, we used a crowdsourcing survey and, and photographs and a four-point uh, ordinal uh, Likert scale, poor, fair, good, and excellent and five parameters of shape, scar formation, localization, size, and overall appearance. These are just some representative uh, photos uh, shown to the respondents. We consulted three different uh, statisticians regarding what might be the best uh, optimal way of studying, uh, designing our study related to the events per variable or events or EPV. Uh, as mentioned, this was a double-blinded study, both from the, uh, 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 the treater as well as the evaluator. Uh, we found that five to 10 events per variable or five EPV for each group was acceptable using an ordinal four-point, again, scale, as well as power calculations later on in the study. There were 383 blinded reviewers. Uh, crowdsourcing uh, population was about 377 online workers, and uh, originally six plastic surgeons for this initial phase of the study. These workers um, underwent attention questions, and what this served as was internal validity in order to make sure that the quality of the questions that they were answering and how they, answering, uh, how they answered were, were valid as best as they could be. These workers also had a unique worker ID, which prevented uh, folks from being repeat customers. Initially, a phase, uh, initial phase of the study involved 23 patients, with so seven in the diamond, seven in the oval, and nine in the inverted V type of incision. These patients were uh, not significant with respect to differences of uh, patient demographics, uh, as one would expect. And so the results. 
The white bar uh, represents the oval type for each group. And so in comparing surgeons and the general populations, we compared each of the incision types with each, each of the other ones. And we can see in terms of the shape, uh, there was a difference in terms of uh, oval shape being more preferred in the general population and not significantly preferred in the surgeon group. With respect to scar, uh, not significant in the surgeon group and significant in the general population for oval again. Uh, localization was something that was uh, debated whether or not to include in relation to the abdominal incision and the abdominal uh, location, but we did anyway. Uh, interestingly, there was a trend of surgeons to, to favor the oval type, and there certainly was a significant uh, finding in the general population for oval. Size, again, uh, non significant in the surgeon group and significant in the, um, for the oval type in the general population. And overall appearance, finally, uh, non significant in, in the surgeon group and significant for the oval in the general population. We then added a second layer of confirmation uh, based on uh, some more thinking about it. We increased the events per variable EPV to 10 for each uh, category, nearly 10 for each type of plastic incision, and increased the certain sampling to 14. This was based on powerful uh, power calculations for a numerical Likert scale. Uh, these were the images that were shown, and interesting to me, uh, some of the oval incisions turned into diamonds over time and, and vice versa from what I can see. Additional methods, again, uh, 391 blinded reviewers at this point, 14 plastic surgeons, and the same number of uh, crowdsourcing um, workers for the general public. And uh, this number uh, increased to 10, 10, and, and 9, respectively. Uh, showing just the surgeons uh, essentially found uh, non significance in shape, uh, scar formation, uh, localization trending but not quite significant, uh, size non significant, as well as overall appearance. And we saw, we found that uh, there were no significant differences with either group uh, in terms of the surgeon population that we surveyed. Uh, in the general public, there was an oval incision preference for all five parameters for, for umbilical construction uh, using an oval incision. And we found that the, this was one way to build, use the power of the crowd for data collection on a larger scale. Thank you. Uh, Dr. William Stevens to uh, discuss. Thank you very much. I appreciate your, uh, your paper, and I've oftentimes myself wondered about this, and uh, I think it's interesting. I have also prefer the oval. Uh, did you control for BMI, and also did you uh, foreshorten the umbilicus or control sure. for the size of the actual opening in which you pulled the, the umbilicus through? Right. And so the BMI question, uh, thank you for those questions, uh, was uh, not standardized. They were basically the same across all three groups, uh, and there was no difference, per se, in terms of the uh, actual BMI difference for the, for the three different parameters of the incisions. Um, with respect to the, the size, uh, the size of the opening ended up being um, a judgment call between 1.5, 2 centimeters, which also has an impact, uh, could have a theoretical impact for, for the uh, BMI as well. Um, before this particular study, uh, uh, depending on a the situation, there would be one of us uh, who would placate or pexy the abdominal down to the abdominal wall, depending on uh, the appearance. But for this purpose of this study, uh, none of the umbilical uh, reconstructions were, were placated. Thank you very much for your presentation, Santanelli from Rome. I would like to ask you if you, uh, we are talking about 23 cases, are we? Uh, and then eventually uh, 29. And then eventually 29, okay. So the uh, diastasis of rectus muscle and the umbilicular hernia may happen approximately in 10% of the DF patients. So in your patient, no one was having an umbilicular hernia or diastasis that required a different type of reconstruction, that this one are not uh, useful for, for that kind of patient. So sometimes you have to do a re, a re to do a, a, a new the, 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 the umbilicus. Totally, you have to remove the umbilicus and do a different plastic. And then, the, um, what kind of technique did you use in that case? Sure. Uh, thank you. Uh, in these patients, none of them uh, did develop uh, a bulge afterwards that required a, a different type of uh, secondary procedure. 
Um, also, uh, there were no cases of, uh, in, this, in this group where, where umbilicus uh, needed to be reconstructed in order to, uh, there, was no re there was no umbilicus. So these were all purely uh, ones that were just uh, uh, moved or transposed. Okay, may I ask a second question? Uh, can you tell me how did you standardize the incision of the abdominal wall? Because that's the most important uh, key factor to achieve a good results. Because if you place it a little bit more uh, down, then you have a better result because that can create an apron on it. So what was the method to find out where to put your incision on the abdominal wall? Right, and that's definitely, a, thank you, a limitation of the study in terms of the fact that there was no, among the three of us, there was no uh, real standard way or location of where the incision was uh, for these uh, patients, which on the overhaul uh, picture, breast reconstruction patients, uh, perhaps uh, I would think the incision was a little bit higher uh, to capture more centrally located peripheries than, than would otherwise be uh, for a cosmetic abdominal plasty uh, patient, although this is something that uh, we could to kind of use for future studies for sure. Um, if I read the, um, or if I inter saw the, uh, the uh, conclusions properly in the data, it looked like the surgeons generally didn't see any difference but right. the crowdsource or the public had a definite preference? Yeah. Is that correct? So can you yeah. comment on that and maybe how this uh, has an implication on how we look at our outcomes in the future in a variety of different ways? Sure. Yeah, that, that's, uh, thanks for that question. Um, it is interesting, you know, uh, one of the comments uh, in, in formulating this uh, collusion and feedback from people was the fact that uh, folks felt that plastic surgeons uh, had more of an astute eye in terms of, uh, of uh, the technique. Uh, when interestingly, uh, this sort of showed um, a difference. Uh, I, I think that um, the third phase that we really need to do um, is how uh, patients perceive their new umbilicus and after the reconstruction, and this is also something that we can study in the future. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Our final talk will be, Does Fat Grafting Influence Postoperative Edema in Orthognathic Surgery? By Raisa Cabrejo, um, Senior Author Derek Steinbacher from Yale. And our discussant will be Helena O. Taylor, MD. Thank you very much. Thanks for the opportunity to present. So we're going to present on whether or not concurrent fat grafting influences postoperative edema with orthognathic surgery. There's no disclosures related to this particular research. So by way of background, orthognathic surgery, as you know, is a powerful technique or series of techniques to enhance facial aesthetics, mostly secondary to bone repositioning and the, re the uh, requisite soft tissue support and improvement of soft tissue positioning as well. In some cases, we know that additional soft tissue augmentation and positioning may be helpful and enhance the aesthetics even further. Fat grafting we've been using for several years now concurrently with orthognathic surgery. In terms of fat grafting, we know that it's used and utilized in a variety of reconstructive and aesthetic indications, mostly for augmentation, for tissue conditioning and reconditioning, and also for the adipose-derived stem cells with possible paracrine modulation uh, on healing and wound healing. And in orthognathic surgery, we're using it mostly for the augmentation contours and for enhancement uh, of the aesthetics. And we've looked at several variables related to this, both by way of processing and in terms of experimental and clinical applications. So the purpose of this study was to look at autologous fat grafting and how this may influence postoperative edema in patients undergoing orthognathic surgery. So that is concurrent fat grafting with orthognathic surgery and looking at edema and swelling. So we expected that in the cases that you're doing fat grafting, this would not influence or if anything, it may increase the edema compared to the non-fat grafting cohorts. So this was a 3D morphometric study. We had two subsets of orthognathic patients, one that underwent concurrent fat grafting and one that did not. There was a blinded analysis of these 3D variables uh, with two separate observers. 
There were serial assessments at preoperatively as well as multiple postoperative time points with two baselines, one pre-op and one a remote post-op baseline. Statistical analysis was then performed on the volumetric results. So we tabulated the, the demographic and operative data. We generated a three-dimensional mask using a series of anthropometric points and measurements and used both MIR as well as GeoMagic to assess the data. In terms of the results, we looked at 116 data sets, 31 patients. Most were female. The average age was 27. The BMIs were very similar between both groups. The amount or magnitude of Lafort advancement was similar between two groups, as was the summation of advancement. Interestingly, though, there were actually uh, a higher per uh, percentage of triple jaws or more comprehensive osteotomies in the fat grafting group. The mean amount of fat injected was 10 mLs. In terms of the fat graft technique, the donor site was typically the anterior abdomen or medial thigh. Uh, we used local anesthesia only, no tumescent. We prepped the fat using the Telfa rolling technique, as we've shown in the past, that that can increase the yield of adipose-derived stem cells. We injected this with 19-gauge needles, typically at the labiomental crease, the nasolabial folds, lips, uh, parasymphysial regions. And the results show it with all comers, as you would expect, there was an increase in edema immediately post-op that went down gradually over the next 12 to 36 weeks. But when you split these into two cohorts, the fat grafting versus the non-fat grafting cohort, we saw a greater reduction in edema at a sooner time point uh, and a more rapid uh, decrease in edema with time in the fat grafting group, contrary to what we would have expected. Regression analysis showed that there was no influence in the absolute amount of fat injected in influencing this in one way or another. And this just shows uh, a series of images and the, the masks that were assessed with time. And here again is the actual three-dimensional image with the preoperative on the left, the immediate post-op at one week in the middle, and then a longer term on the right. And here, too, the preoperative all the way to the left. The yellow arrow is the one-week post-op, and then a series of subsequent time points moving along from left to right. So in conclusion, uh, the majority of uh, facial edema after orthognathic begins to resolve by 12 weeks. However, interestingly, uh, when fat grafting is performed concurrently, there's a greater reduction in postoperative edema and a quicker resolution to the steady state point. And this may be due to the anti-inflammatory impact of fat grafting, despite adding additional volume, despite trauma from needle sticks and injections, and despite the more comprehensive osteotomies that were performed in that group. In the future, we're going to uh, increase the number of analyses and follow these patients out to a greater extent postoperatively and look at a greater number, uh, over 300 or so. We want to also look at subjective and qualitative analysis and see if this really impacts from a subjective perspective the aesthetics, the aesthetics of the result, and then also look at ways that we can look at the longevity of the result and the fat with time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Derek. Um, many congratulations, not just on your be beautiful surgical outcomes, but also on your very thoughtful and quantitative assessment of your results using this technology. It's certainly tantalizing, if a little bit counterintuitive, to believe that adding fat grafting as an adjuvant procedure at the time of orthognathic surgery actually leads to faster um, and more complete resolution of edema. But I do wonder if we can really draw that conclusion based on the data that we have today. One issue is really whether group one is comparable to group two, not just in terms of the demographics, which are a bit different, um, but also the bony movements. Perhaps the genioplasties are hiding some of that edema that we see on these measurements. Um, and third, if I understand correctly, your group one was done at an earlier time point in your career than your group two. The second issue really has to do with the validity of using 3D photogrammetry surface data to make inferences about what's happening beneath the skin. 
Um, certainly the big bugaboo in studies like this is aligning your preoperative and your postoperative images on landmarks that you're potentially moving surgically. I think the bigger issue is, um, you know, one potential interpretation of this data is that the fat is actually leading to atrophy of the bone. And while I think this is unlikely, you could draw that conclusion from this data. So I'm wondering if there's any data that you might think about getting using some kind of adjuvant imaging, whether it's ultrasound or MRI, to really prove to you and prove to us that these are differences in volume that you can attribute to edema. Great. Those are all excellent and very valid points. And uh, certainly in the future, we'd like to limit these to the same exact type of uh, movements and procedures and add a greater end that we can look at this. And certainly one thing we thought, too, is maybe the uh, edema decreased sooner because of the fat actually resorbing. Maybe there was an increase in volume that was not really different at the immediate postoperative period. And because it resorbed more rapidly, that uh, sort of confounded the data. But, uh, you know, the decrease really occurred by 6 or 12 weeks, and we would have expected that if the fat itself was resorbing, that that would, and it, some of the fat certainly would be resorbing and is resorbing, but that would occur over a longer period of time, three, four months, six months, uh, something to that extent. And I think the uh, difficulty with um, uh, actually labeling the fat or radio labeling the fat is, is just, you know, having patient compliance and, you know, having a research protocol to enable us to do that. Certainly MRIs may be effective, but I think even with MRIs, it's going to be difficult to tease out what is actually the fat that's been injected versus muscle hypertrophy uh, and things like that. So, Derek, thank you. We, we always learn from you when we hear about the, your orthognathic techniques, which are excellent. The, um, the real question we have as orthognathic surgeons is, w if we're going to fat graft, should we do it at the time of the procedure or in a delayed fashion? That's the question that you're trying to help us to answer. But as you just mentioned, it would be nice to know, you, you know that at 12 weeks, the, the volume decrease was, uh, what, the, what you said, there was a 62% decrease at one week, and by 12 weeks, it was, it was, um, it was equaling out, indicating that the, or, or that there was a faster decrease in volume in the, um, in the fat grafted group. So the question then becomes, as you say, is that resorption or decrease in edema? One way you could answer that is looking at the two groups at a year out, perhaps, and seeing what those volumes are in comparison. And then perhaps if you were to continue that study, look at those volumes in people who had immediate fat grafting versus those who had delayed fat grafting. Great. Yeah. And, you know, one reason that we took this on as a project is just because subjectively we we're noticing less bruising and, and less swelling, you know, after a, a couple of months postoperatively and, you know, having a lot of 3D tools, uh, it seemed the best way. But we didn't quantify bruising, and that might be a, another avenue to take as well. Derek. Um Great presentation. Uh, really enjoyed your incredible results. Uh, I would just mimic uh, what Arun said. You've taught us all a lot in this arena. Um, question for you is, uh, what, what levels do you try to fat graft, subcutaneous, submuscular, and how do you control not getting into that subperiosteal space where obviously your fat would most likely just go away? Yeah, that, that's a great question. And it's also sort of a confounder, too, because some of the fat was injected in the malar region and the infra, infraorbital region, which wasn't measured by the, the mask that we used. In the areas where the mask is used, you know, it's typically in the subcutaneous plane uh, because the entire periosteum has been stripped and we can't really place it right on the periosteum in the lower region, in the lower maxillomandibular region. So it's mostly in the mentalis. It's at the step-offs of the genioplasty and the nasolabial folds. but in the muscle and in the superficial and deep subcutaneous spaces. And then as far as take rates in various places that you've put your fat, whether it's near a scar or, or in the nasal labial fold versus in a more animate region like perioral, have you noticed a difference in take rates? Um, no, it's difficult to tell though because some of it's edema. You know, there's a lot of perioral edema and lip edema postoperatively, so it's difficult to tell how much of that is edema versus the fat that's staying. Um, and something that would be great to look at. Uh, one more question coming up. Hey, 
Hey, Derek. Um, just a quick question. I know I love watching your studies on 3D imaging, but did you look at all um, on table what the results were? Because I just wonder if that could tease out potentially what is edema versus the effects of fat grafting. I know it doesn't totally take out the effects of edema, but I, I certainly think it would minimize that. Yeah, we didn't do that, but we do have the portable 3D camera now, so that might be a, a good uh, implementation of that. But I think it might be skewed based on how long the case takes, and you know, there's going to be more edema in a longer case as opposed to a, a shorter, quicker case. We do do the same edema control measures at the beginning, the same amount of decadron, the same amount of hypotensive anesthesia. But you know, as everybody knows, there's differing rates of bleeding and, and things like that that we can experience that uh, seem to occur irrespective of those measures. Great. This concludes. Uh, if there's no further question, any other questions? Okay. This will conclude uh, this morning's session. So we will reconvene again at 1:30 <coughs> for the panel technology. 1:30 p.m. Thank you. Have a nice day.